And there we go. Now you know the meeting's being recorded, aside from seeing the, the nifty uh, cloud icon up the top. I always do that, by the way, just as a, as a quick tip for anybody in a mediation uh, or, or arbitration. Uh, not that by default you should be recording, but for whatever reason you do have a need to record, you should always set that in your Zoom settings so that uh, you know you're recording. So just to briefly reiterate, since now we have the recording, this is a meeting of the New York County Lawyers Association ADR Committee tonight. We're going to be featuring uh, three wonderful speakers from NAM. Questions and answers uh, should be posted in the chat. For those people who are familiar with webinars, uh, we don't have an official Q&A when meeting format. And so uh, you should just post uh, whatever questions you have in the chat. After every uh, break that we have tonight in terms of topics in the program, we will be um, taking a couple of minutes just to pause to field questions. Chris Nelson and I will be doing that. Again, Chris Flatgate is our co-chair of the committee and Nelson Timken is our vice chair. So tonight, uh, we have three wonderful speakers, again, from a National Arbitration Mediation, ma'am, um, Jackie Silvey is general counsel, the Honorable John P. de Blasi, uh, retired, but uh, still called judge, justice of the Supreme Court uh, from the commercial division, and um, we're going to get to everybody's bio a little bit uh, as, as well, just before everybody speaks, and finally rounding out uh, the panel tonight is Mr. Richard Byrne, uh, who is a commercial specialist. So tonight we are going to be talking uh, about three topics uh, pertaining to NAM. First is going to be an overview of NAM from a, the New York and national perspective by uh, Ms. Sylvie. And then we're going to have a, uh, a discussion because uh, both Judge de Blasi and Mr. Byrne are going to be dealing with these topics simultaneously. Uh, the first part of that discussion is going to be inside the mind of the mediator. And then uh, the second part is going to be a discussion in ADR and H of COVID-19. So it's uh, 6.15 and uh, we're going to be running this program from 6.15 to 7.30 and then at 7.30 our program uh, time runs till 8. Uh, the meeting time runs till 8. But we will um, have general questions. We're looking at it from 7.30 to 8. Again, nothing's written in stone, uh, but we're going to try to move things along uh, based upon you know the schedule that we have. And uh, we have so many great topics here tonight that we're, we're very anticipating, you know, uh, very, very excited to get to everything, and we're anticipating a really great program tonight. So without further ado, let me just quickly introduce uh, Jackie Sylvie. Jacqueline Sylvie is general counsel of NAM, as I said before, is involved in various management operations of the company, including uh, panel development, oversight and implementation of commercial and employment dispute resolution initiatives, the creation and implementation of various rules of procedure, and the general business affairs of the company. She also oversees neutral recruitment throughout the United States and internationally. And yes, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions tonight uh, regarding that. Ms. Sylvia is a frequent lecturer on uh, various legal and arbitration issues. Uh, she's been a panel member and moderator in the subject of arbitration mediation numerous times throughout her career, both on a regional and a national level. Additionally, she's been invited a guest speaker by many of the nation's largest law firms to discuss industry-specific developments as well as arbitration and mediation services for certain practice areas. Uh, she has been published on both a regional and national level on several occasions and honored by the Long Island Business News with the 2020 Leadership and Law Award and recognized by the same publication as the 2020 Who's Who Women in Professional Services. Prior to joining NAM, Ms. Sylvie was a senior litigation associate and house counsel for Chubb Insurance Company, representing the carrier's corporate insurance under their respective directors and officers' policies. She has litigated in the federal courts in both the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York, the New York State Courts, various uh, city and state agencies. And I can tell you, having been involved with NAM as an advocate in the arbitration process, she gives wonderful procedural guidance and has a, a really uh, unique perspective as, as well as uh, many different insights, uh, even when she has to deal with people who uh, are advocates, uh, she's extremely deft in that regard. So uh, again, just to uh, quickly remind everybody, uh, please place your questions in the chat. Uh, you can do that by clicking Alt H uh, in the window as we have our speakers going. And also, please mute yourselves uh, from this point onwards if you're uh, not speaking. To do that, click on Alt A, Alt Alpha, Alt A uh, for Windows and Mac. Uh, I'm not a Mac user, you're on your own for that. Without further ado, uh, Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elan. And thank you to the rest of the ADR committee for inviting us tonight. Um, before I start, I just have to give a shout out. I saw as the pictures were coming out, uh, Sherry Wetch, one of our neutrals from Texas is actually joining in tonight. So I just want to say hi to Sherry and thanks for, for joining. Um, 
anyhow, as Elon said, I've been with NAM. It's now almost 14 years. And I have various roles here as general counsel and handle various day-to-day uh, -day functions of the company. For those of you who may not be familiar with NAM, I'd like to give you a little bit of background and overview about us. NAM is actually one of the large, the three largest ADR companies in the United States, mm -hmm. the other two being the AAA and JAMS. Uh, we've been providing ADR services for almost 30 years. And the company was started actually right here in New York in Garden City. And we have grown to be a major provider of ADR services in New York and throughout the United States. We have a panel of over 2,600 neutrals consisting of top tier, former judges and practicing attorney specialists. And we administrate mediations and arbitrations in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and in major cities around the world. We handle a broad array of case types covering many different subject areas. And to give you an idea and share a little bit of fun facts about NAM, here in New York, we administrate the majority of the personal injury matters that are mediated or arbitrated. And I actually think it would be fair estimate to say we have about a 90% market share. And we work with every major insurance carrier, defense firm, and most plaintiff's law firms. That's obviously in addition to the other types of work we do, which are based in the commercial employment and other parts of our business. Outside of New York, it's reversed. We handle more commercial and employment matters than personal injury matters throughout the country. And we administrate employment initiatives for Fortune 100 companies and other major corporations all over the United States and internationally. In addition to a wealth of, of commercial disputes, by virtue of the fact that we're, NAM is designated as an ADR provider in many contracts, throughout the United States. And we obviously handle individual matters that come to us from attorneys and, and various law firms in different states. As an administrator, we offer different sets of rules and procedures for different types of disputes. And we have a dedicated and a trained case management team to handle the administration of these matters. Our case managers are trained and have the background to handle many of the different types of cases which we handle and which often require the application of different rules or different procedures or require specific processes or procedures or whose administration is actually nuanced because the case is part of a particular type of program and thus is procedurally different than other matters. Specific to New York, we have conference facilities in several parts of the state uh, and throughout the New York metro area. But we also have the ability for certain types of matters that require either highly sensitive, or that are, I should say, that are highly sensitive or require privacy. We even offer separate spaces away from the day to day conference center, and we have different facilities available if needed. So we really do focus a lot on our customer service and, and giving the best possible experience to those who use us. Um, if I can do a little shameless self-promotion, the recognition of NAM as a true pioneer in the field of ADR has been acknowledged in various accolades that we've received over the years, including being ranked the number one ADR provider in the New York Law Journal Best of Survey for the past 10 years. We've been voted a top ADR firm in the United States by the National Law Journal Best of Survey seven years in a row. We've been ranked the number one best national ADR provider by the Corporate Council's Best of Survey two years in a row. And we've been ranked as a best of ADR provider in the New Jersey, Texas, New England, and Midwest surveys. As I mentioned before, NAM has over 2,600 neutrals throughout the United States and internationally. And we have a team that specifically recruits and vets all of our neutrals to get the best of the best. Uh, specific to New York, at the end of September, the New York Law Journal Best of Survey ranked NAM mediators in eight out of the top 10 mediator slots, and our arbitrators ranked seven out of the top 10 uh, in New York State. Uh, and that's been a pretty consistent rating uh, and ranking over the last several years. Nationally, on a national basis, two of the top Three ranked mediators in the United States are actually here tonight with us, which is Judge de Blasi and Richard Byrne. 
focusing on New York, we take a little bit of a different approach than possibly some of the other ADR providers when it comes to our neutral and panel. Uh, candidly, I think our process is probably a little more selective than some of the other providers. And the reason is that we only incrementally increase our New York panel every year. Uh, it's based on need, it's based on the growth of the business but it's also based on the conscious decision because many of our arbitrators and mediators are doing this on a full-time basis. And we don't wanna just add people to add them and then have them sit on a panel um, without really having caseloads or, or enough business. So we incrementally increase them and I'll go through the selection process in a minute. Um, and really the end goal is that we're, because of, we are so selective, we're giving the clients the best that there is. And we want clients who use NAM to come back, use us again. Client retention is extremely important to us and that everybody have an overall positive experience. I am often asked, um, how do you choose a mediator? And what do you look for? And should they be experts in an underlying dispute? So in New York, there's little regulatory guidelines about being a mediator. Um, anyone really could be a mediator. You don't even have to be a lawyer. Um, but I will tell you that what I have seen and our feedback is to be a really good mediator, you have to have the right skill set. And the mediator's role is not to decide who's right or wrong. The end goal is to bring the parties to a resolution. So it takes skill and patience. Former judges have to remember they're no longer on the bench. And practicing attorneys have to remember they're not advocating for one side or the other. We look at prior experience, reputation, certain knowledge of the underlying subject areas if they're being recruited or if they're joining the panel to handle specific matters. But mission critical from what we found is the mediator's personality. It's like I said, it's a very special skill set, and they have to be a really good listener and a really good communicator. And I know this is somewhat underestimated when you list the checkoffs of what we look for, but it's so extremely important that they have the relatability factor to the people in the room. Um, in fact, many of the feet, a lot of the feedback we'll get after a case isn't necessarily, oh, they knew the subject matter so amazing. It's, they were great, they handled the situation, they understood it, they were able to follow it, they listened, they communicated well, and those are the, are the traits that we look for in our mediators. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna to touch, and I know we're gonna to touch on this a little bit later on, but given the age of COVID um, and what we have now all resorted to, which is technological advancements and dependency, um, I just wanna say that NAM actually as a, an ADR provider has been providing uh, video conferencing services for at least 25 years. Um, obviously, in the age of COVID, when everything happened in March, we were able to successfully transition and pretty seamlessly all of our in-person hearings to video conference. And we've really conducted thousands of virtual mediations at this point through, you know, uh, 2020. Recognizing that the use of video conferencing is definitely here to stay. We do provide four different platforms for our clients, Zoom. WebEx by Cisco, Skype, and BlueJeans by Verizon. And our Zoom platform is customized using specific settings that are configured differently than the generally available Zoom commercial account. And it is also HIPAA compliant to afford the maximum amount of security to the platform. We also spent a lot of time training all of our neutrals when we converted many of our hearings over to video conferencing. So our neutrals are well-trained and our IT staff is available at all times to monitor the cases and make sure that everything really moves forward without a hitch. That is my very, very brief overview of NAM. Um, I am happy to answer any further questions that anybody has now about NAM, but you will see that by having Judge de Blasi and Richard Byrne with me here tonight and going through so many of the other topics, I think that there's gonna be a lot more information that comes out. Um, but I will ask Ilan at this point, if there's anybody who has a specific question of me, and if not, then I can move on to 
moderating Judge de Blasi and Richard Byrne. Well, we do actually have a question that just came through from Dandra Roche, and she asks, uh, what are NAM's diversity analytics for its diverse neutrals? Okay, so diversity is something that is extremely important to us. It is something that we focus on as a, on a regular basis. If you look at our panel uh, in New York and throughout the country, it is not something that is ignored or, or overlooked. Um, what I can say is it is a consideration in all of our recruiting. But again, you are dealing with a certain pool that is coming off of, let's say, a bench or a pool that is a certain level in an in an a law firm or corporate setting. And sometimes we are dependent more on what is available to bring us in and meet with certain requirements, such as the amount of years practicing law and their subject matter experience. But um, overall, uh, we are constantly striving to address it participate in, in all of the activities that we can to attract a diverse panel to NAM. Okay. Uh, we had another question that uh, came in from Leslie Treff. Why does NAM not use Microsoft Teams? You know, that's interesting. When, and of course I would need my IT director to really come here, but I know that when it, when we started with the bigger transfer for all of our cases, one of the things we needed, and which is why we were so dependent on Zoom, was because with most, arbitration's a little bit different, but mediation really needed us to do all those breakout rooms. And I think our IT department focused on the fact that Zoom was gonna be the better solution for us. Um, but I have to get back to you a little bit more on, on if there was more reasoning to the decision to go with Zoom over Microsoft. Uh, to take a quick note since someone asked this uh, another meeting I was on today with Microsoft Teams there's still a limitation with respect to the mirroring of video and people are using virtual backgrounds so uh, you'll still see a, a virtual background with text in Microsoft Teams with the text reversed as opposed to Zoom so it's maybe just a quick re reason for now uh, why they're uh, not going for it and also uh, Teams is supposed to have breakout rooms so this is obviously more significant than uh, virtual backgrounds Teams is supposed to have breakout rooms uh, implemented soon, but they haven't as of yet. Uh, and that could be another reason as well. That was, that. Yeah. yeah, that was a driving force because of the need for us to break out. And also because a lot of the attorneys are not sitting with their clients during this time. So you have an attorney in one room, you have their client in one breakout room, you have the other side in the breakout room, you have adjusters coming in. So we really needed the ability to have multiple breakout rooms available. Um, and I don't think that the, the technology provided that, you know, certainly back in March. Yeah, that's for sure. That, that was always that. We have another question that uh, came in. It was a private one that, uh, yeah, Leslie, you're, you're correct. Teams has recently implemented. I don't know if it's been completely rolled out yet, but uh, Jack is also right. Definitely was not in existence as of March. And just in case anybody's following on platforms very recently, freeconferencecall.com also rolled out their uh, version of breakout rooms uh, in case anybody wants to use them as an alternative. So yeah, we have another question that was given to me uh, privately uh, from one of our attendees. Can you ask Jackie about precisely what she means by concerns about HIPAA compliance in a PI case? Uh, I'm not looking for any proprietary stuff, just the generic issues. Well, recognizing is certainly at the beginning of all this security was a big issue. Um, even with respect to Zoom, when, when we started back in March with doing this on a regular basis, there is a special configuration and a special process you can use through Zoom to make sure that the security is in fact meets the requirements of HIPAA as far as the transmission and when you're dealing with screen sharing, when you're dealing with showing documents on the screen. And so through that process, we were able to get the HIPAA compliance certification. Okay. That uh, takes care of that. We're all caught up now on uh, a question. So we're gonna be moving now into uh, the second uh, portion of our program where we're gonna be bringing on uh, Judge de Blasi and Mr. Byrne. Uh, they're gonna be speaking on a two separate stages uh, in the topics of inside the mind of the mediator and ADR in the age of COVID-19. Before they take the floor, I want to have uh, Nelson Timken, our vice chair, uh, introduce Judge de Blasi, and that's gonna be followed by Chris Flagate, our co-chair, introducing Mr. Byrne. 
and then we'll hand it over to Jackie, Judge Wassey, Mr. Byrne for the uh, remaining portion of the program. Again, uh, do feel free at any time to put in questions, uh, you know, that we're refielding and you see how this works. It's working, working so far very nicely. And um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Nelson to introduce Judge de Blasi. Nelson, take it away. Good evening, everybody. It's so good to see everyone here tonight and so many uh, familiar faces. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Judge John de Blasi. Uh, John de Blasi is uh, a retired judge of the Supreme Court Commercial Division, where he spent 10 years. His uh, bio says that he resolved hundreds of matters, but I'm sure it was more like thousands after 10 years in the Commercial Division. Uh, he is a full-time neutral with NAM. He is uh, one of their neutrals that in 2020 for the seventh year of the row of in a row was named one of the top three mediators in the United States by the National Law Journal best of survey. He has mediated and or arbitrated numerous commercial matters, complex insurance coverage disputes involving multiple defendants, complex land use actions, large commercial matters. And according to his bio and what we all know, pretty much any type of dispute that you can name, Judge de Blasi has been involved in and is successfully uh, mediated and or arbitrated. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Judge John de Blasi. Take it away, Judge. Anyway, and just before we get to that, we also want to introduce, because you're speaking at the same time, we're also going to have uh, Mr. Richard Byrne introduced. And Chris, you're going to do that. And then they both can take it away. Great job, Nelson. Thank you. Chris, take it away. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Nelson. And uh, welcome to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you all here with us. And we hope you have a, a great evening with us. Uh, I'd like to introduce Richard P. Byrne. Uh, Richard has been serving as a mediator uh, since mediation first became on the horizon as a cost-effective means of resolving litigation and other disputes. He is well-respected professionally and has a reputation for bringing the most contentious disputes to a full and final resolution. Uh, Mr. Byrne has been a certified mediator with the United States District Court since 1992. Uh, and he brings more than 25 years of ADR experience to NAM's New York Metro panel of neutrals. His legal career of over 35 years brings an added dimension of expertise to the matters over which he presides, which have involved commercial disputes, employment discrimination claims, wage and hour, FSLA claims, FLSA claims, sorry, construction, and uh, complex personal injury and property damages. Mr. Byrne has earned the distinction of being voted a top three mediator, like Judge, Judge de Blasi in the, uh, in the 2020 National Law Journal Best of Survey, and was ranked a top 10 mediator by the 2019 New York Law Journal Best of Survey, uh, also for the past five years. Uh, he was voted a top three mediator by the 2018 Corporate Council Best of Survey, uh, and for the third straight year, he was named a National Law Journal ADR champion. Uh, so we're honoured and thrilled to have uh, Mr. Byrne with us this evening. And with that, I will uh, turn proceedings over to Jackie as the moderator. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Judge de Blasi. Uh, and I hope everybody enjoys the, uh, the discussion that's about to follow. Thank you. So one of the most valuable things we've seen overall is when Richard and, and Judge de Blasi both really tell us what it's like being a mediator. So I've prepared some questions to ask them and hopefully they will then share their insight with you. Um, prior to the actual mediation session, what insight can you share as to how an attorney should prepare and get ready? Richard, you want me to go first? You want to go, to, go uh, first? You know what, I'll, I'll start, John. First of all, let me thank all of you for having us here this evening. I, I certainly, I'll happy to speak for Jackie and John. We're, we're thrilled to be here, to be among colleagues who feel as strongly about the ADR process as we do and, and, and devote a good amount of their time to mediations and arbitrations. And we're happy to discuss our love of, of the practice as well. Um, to go to Jackie's question, I, I think the first thing I would make note of and certainly encourage you when you speak to your parties is, is talk to us ahead of time. 
you know, we, um, John and I often joke around, speak to your mediator early and often. Uh, it's, it's, it's an aspect of the process that too few people take advantage of since we do have the ability in, in mediation for ex parte uh, communications. You know, I certainly encourage people. I know John does, does the same. It, it's something you can say to your parties, please call us, talk to us ahead of time. You know, the, the topics can range from procedural to substantive and it's helpful to us and I'm sure it would be helpful to you as mediators to to get some of these issues previewed in advance you get a chance to process some of the information get a sense of where the parties may be coming from out of the gate um, and and it's a good opportunity to develop rapport from 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 both sides um, I also think it's it's helpful because we can be alerted to a particular issue, you know, maybe there's some bad blood, maybe there have been some hard feelings, maybe we've got a particularly sensitive plaintiff who we have to be mindful of. So again, um, just kind of kicking it off in response to Jackie's question, I, I, I would say encourage the parties for whom you're mediating to speak to you in advance. John? Um, you know, I completely agree with that. And I think a lot of times uh, what we do is actually initiate the discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the attorneys in advance. And, uh, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with Richard. And I think it goes to sort of a larger uh, thing that attorneys should be aware of, which is use us mm -hmm. at all phases of the proceeding. Use us, call upon us to assist you in any way uh, you think we might be able to assist you, whether that's pre mediation, during the negotiation process, post mediation, if the mediation is not successful. And what I would say to you, you know, in terms of uh, situations where I've done this in advance and I've initiated it on my own and it worked out very well, just to give you a, a sort of like a real world example, one case I can talk about because it's public, case involving uh, Jeff Deskovic, who was imprisoned for 17 years on a false rape and murder charge. And uh, I was selected to do the civil rights mediation uh, by uh, the Innocence Project, uh, Barry Sheck and Nick Bruston, as well as the County of Westchester. And I read the briefs and I said to myself, my God, this young man went in when he was 17 years old, was completely vindicated. Uh, his conviction was vacated. And now I'm going to be in a position as a mediator where I'm going to be speaking to him during the course of the mediation process and also try to understand what he went through because there was a concession of liability in the case. There was no issue of liability. How am I gonna do this? You know, this is a human being I have to work with. So I called the attorneys and I said to him, look, I think it would really be a good idea for me to meet with counsel uh, and the plaintiff before the mediation. I wanna get an understanding of who he is, what he went through and I, also want to, in a case of that magnitude, develop some type of rapport with him. And all of the attorneys agreed and we set up the meeting and uh, it, it was incredibly moving for me. And I think that's one thing Richard and I share is a passion for what we do and a real uh, empathy for all of the parties that we work with and a real concern for all of the parties. And I'll never forget, Jeff was telling me that um, when he was released from prison and his attorneys took him to a restaurant. He had a severe anxiety attack because he hadn't been able to select his own food in 17 years. That he didn't know what the internet was. He had never used a cell phone. He'd never used email. And that coming out of prison, people who encountered him, even though he had been vindicated, will either think that he had done something wrong or would feel that he was so messed up uh, that they could not have any type of friendship or relationship with him. And he said to me, um, you know, this is particularly div difficult with women now because I want to date. And there was a pause and he looked at me and he said, maybe you could give me some advice with that. And I said to him, listen, you've had enough injustice in your life. You <laughs> asking for me advice about that. But what, what happened at that moment was an incredible breakthrough because it established a rapport. And the rapport, number one, that I had with him helped us during the course of the negotiation process. And separately, and I know Richard does this in the same way, it really brought me to a better understanding. And of course, we do all different types of cases. This is a unique case. 
a better understanding of what he had actually gone through. It's, you know, it's one thing to read it uh, in a brief. It's another thing to speak to the person who went through it. Richard, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you, you know what? I, I want to jump to something John mentioned, which is really on, on the tail end of speaking to your mediator. And, and he mentioned the post-mediation communications, because those of you who are out looking to build an ADR practice, and I heard Elon mention there's a, a seminar coming up on that as well. I, I will tell you the most valuable thing you can do is follow up on your cases that don't resolve. And you build a certain cachet, uh, you, you are able to demonstrate to your parties you're really committed to the process. I, I, I joke sometimes and I say my compulsiveness is really good for being a mediator. It's not so great for my marriage, but that's another topic. But you know, you, you, you don't give up. And I, I have right to my right, I have my follow-up list and I've probably got eight or 10 cases now. And when I catch a breath or I'm between rooms and I'm waiting on my parties, you know what? I shoot out a quick email. Hey, you were supposed to get back to me last week. Where are we on that offer? So again, I think as John points out, speaking to your mediator or, and encouraging your parties to speak to, to you all is important before and it's important after as well. Without a doubt, and we have, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's unique to, to NAM's mediators because I know all of us, um, and one of the wonderful things about NAM is not only um, are, are, do we have all great people there, but we've all become friends over the years. We've been doing this for so long and we bounce uh, things off of each other. But I, I think one of the things that we all do is follow up. And one of the things that's critically important is to understand that some negotiations, cannot conclude in one session and that you have to work after the fact to try and get it done. And it goes back to what I said is using your mediator, your mediator should be available to you post mediation to help you try and bring about uh, a settlement. Uh, and one of the other things that I would say, and I sometimes see this during the course of mediations, people tend to rush. I think all attorneys are generally speaking in a rush. They're very focused on subject matter. They're very focused on facts. They're very focused on arguments and they're in a rush to explain over and over again um, what uh, their position is. And I think Jackie hit the nail on the head because I've said it a hundred times. I know Jackie's probably bored of hearing me say this, but I've said that <laughs> I've been saying it. Jackie's been with Nam for 14 years. I'm 13 years in now. I've always said that the um, you know, best thing for a former judge is to forget that they were a judge when they become a mediator because it is a different skill set. You know, as a judge, I had a lot of bullets in my gun. I could, you know, advance discovery. I could decide motions quickly. I could slow discovery down. You know, you can sort of uh, manipulate the process to encourage settlements, but as a mediator, um, you actually really have to use your diplomatic skills uh, to manage the process. And I just want to say two things that I think are critically important. It's actually three things. One is using us. Secondly, is the concept of time and mediation going into it. Don't rush. You know, you have to commit to spending the time. And I will tell you, time is your ally. And I think Richard's going to tell you the same thing, that generally speaking, the longer the mediation goes, uh, the greater the possibility is if you keep the negotiation going, even when people hit the wall and they're yelling and screaming at us and stomping their feet and threatening to walk out, time is the ally. And my philosophy is if I was on uh, the side of it as being an attorney, I would let the other side walk out before I did. I would hang in there until the very end. And I'm just going to give you one other very quick practical suggestion or like insight. You know, it's important as mediators that we know the law, we know how to evaluate cases. Richard and I, we've talked about it. We're chameleons. We're going to adjust our game, so to speak, or our style to every case because you have different personalities, different facts, different types of cases. And it's just like when Richard and I tried cases, you go into a different case, you have to adjust for the parties, the facts, the jury. So we adjust continuously. But at the end of the day, it's all about negotiation. That's really what it's about. It's not about subject matter. It is about the law to the extent that you have to know how the law applies. You have to know how to evaluate but it is a negotiation and most attorneys forget about that. And I'm gonna make one quick suggestion to you. There's a great book out there called Never Split the Difference. Um, it was written by Chris Voss, who's a, who was the former chief hostage nego negotiator for the FBI. Um, the principles that he used 
in negotiation in the FBI are absolutely translatable, which is the point of the book, to everyday life. And the startling thing to me, when I read the book, it's everything that Richard and I do on a daily basis. But it's so important if you're an attorney, you would not have that insight necessarily. I would suggest reading this book because it'll really give you a good idea about negotiations. Richard? So I want to pick up on, on John's theme about time and the use of time and, and what to us is very important. And that is the preparation the attorneys put into the mediation before they come to see us. Um, and, you know, I, I would encourage the, the parties that come before you to, to invest the time in their mediation statements. You know, it, it's, it's so valuable uh, to us, I'm sure, as to the rest of you as, as mediators to get a well-written, well-reasoned pre-mediation submission so that we, as the neutrals, then have the time to absorb the information. You know, we're not hearing things at the first go round at the mediation itself. And this is all apropos of Jackie's question, you know, that we then have the ability to sit down, study the briefs, have an appreciation for where the parties are coming from. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very helpful to encourage your parties to exchange briefs too. I mean, often the default is, well, it's confidential. I don't want the other side to see it. And I know John agrees with me on this. Listen, on a practical level, by the end of the session, everything's on the table anyway, right? Why not put it out there and exchange it ahead of time? I, I encourage the parties that come before me to use a hybrid system. You know, exchange, if there's anything that is, uh, of particular sensitivity and you don't want the other side to see, well, you know what? Then send me a separate letter, right? A supplemental submission for my eyes only so I can have the appreciation for that particular issue that you don't want the other side to see. But in the meantime, most of the information has been exchanged. And, you know, I say to the, to the attorneys, look, remember, you're not really writing for your adversary. You guys have been spending a lot of time together. You probably have a pretty good appreciation for where he or she is coming from. You're writing for your adversary's client. You know damn well they're going to send it to the client. That's your audience. So why wouldn't you take advantage of that, right? But it takes time, right? As John said before, lawyers are always rushing. Everything is last minute. Everything is the deadline. So when I do have my pre-mediation calls with the parties, I encourage them, look, invest the time up front. Put together that pre-mediation statement. Listen, it, the, the truth is it makes them focus, right? It makes them prepare. It makes them distill down the issues so that they come in ready, willing, and, and hopefully able, as, as John says, then, then to negotiate. John? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Along with that, Rich, Richard mentioned two things um, when he was speaking about your adversary. W what does shock me at times is that um, attorneys will come in or corporate representatives will come in and they don't know who their adversary is. And they don't have a game plan and they don't know what to expect from their adversary. And you know what, you can very often uh, do your dil due diligence on the person who you're gonna be up against in a mediation, uh, because it is, you know, ultimately a negotiation and adversarial process. And the best example I can give to it and give uh, is, is one recently where I had uh, a mediation with an attorney who I would just call a stone cold killer. Uh, this is someone who's tried cases, cotton verdicts that, you know, boggle your mind, settlements that boggle your mind. And, uh, is someone who you should fear if you're coming in on the other side, not unduly, you know, not to be afraid that you can't try a case against him because he's certainly lost cases, but his negotiating style is impossible. And what was shocking to me is I was in the mediation, we had close to 40 people at the mediation, uh, five on this one attorney's side and the other 35 on the other side and not one person in the other room of 35 people knew who they were dealing with. So when the initial demand of $400 million was made, it was like a riot in the other room when I walked in and communicated it. And of course, 
uh, as the mediator, they're asking me like, what's going on? Why is that? And I said to them, I said, look, this is, don't you know who you're dealing with? You know, I'm not saying he's getting $400 million or anywhere near that on the case, but this is who he is. This is the way he negotiates. They did not know who he was. They did not know his record at trial. They did not know the type of cases that he had handled. They did not know the type of negotiation style that he engaged in. And you need to know all that. Well, I learned a lesson out of this, okay? Because on the next case that I had with this attorney, which was a similar case, I called the attorneys on the other side and I said to them, listen, you have to know what to expect with this attorney when you mediate with him. And this is what's going to happen. And it's going to shock you and boggle your mind. And it's going to make you completely insane, but you have to expect it to happen. Of course, we have the mediation and it happens. However, the difference is this time, the other side was prepared for it by me. I took the initiative to do it, but you have to know your adversary and you have to have a game plan coming in. And I find very often that attorneys come in with no game plan for the negotiation that they're going to engage in. I did my first mediation as an advocate about two years ago. All these years, 40 years of practicing law, I never represented a client at a mediation. I was asked to come in, do the mediation by a firm who didn't normally do uh, mediations. It was an employment case. I reviewed everything. I did the mediation brief. I met with the clients. I checked out my adversary and I decided that my game plan was going to be totally hostile and uncooperative because I was dealing with a hardball firm on the other side and hardball lawyers. And I knew there's not gonna be anything nice about this. This is the only thing that they're going to understand. And it actually worked out quite well, seven months post mediation after that initial session, we got the case settled. I don't like to be like that, that's not who I am, but I made a plan in advance as to that's who I was going to be in that particular case, even though honestly, that doesn't suit my personality, Richard. Well, you know, what I thought we might do is, is move now to talk about the, the mediation it, itself um, and what John and I like to see as part of the process when we've got the parties in the room. And let me kick it off by talking about opening statements because, uh, you know, there, there is a little bit of a philosophical difference out there uh, as to whether or not opening statements should be given, whether they're helpful. I'm a big believer, and I know John is too, in opening statements. Um, I think, you, you know, we often hear, well, we, we know the case. We've been together for years. You know what? Let, we just want to get down to business. We, we, we want to bypass the opening statements. Well, I haven't been around in the case in years. I don't know it quite to the same degree that you folks do based on your um, years together. And it might be helpful for me to hear. And what I find fascinating about the opening statements is where the nuances are. Where, where you know, you read the submissions and, you know, presumably you've got, you, you, you all may have had the same experience. You, you read the submissions and yet when the parties come in to do their opening statements, they focus on points that you might not have expected them to focus on. And they may have passed on certain points you thought they might focus on. So it gives you a better feel, I think, in real time for where the parties truly believe the issues lie. Um, and, and I also encourage the attorneys when, when I speak to them beforehand and say, listen, you're not really there to give an opening statement to your adversary. You're there to educate me and maybe more importantly, talk to your adversary's client, much like we've hoped the briefs have been sent on to the clients. Well, here's an opportunity. Where else but in mediation, in the, in the confidentiality of this setting, can you speak to your adversary's client? And listen, that can be done for a number of purposes. I, I had a matter earlier this week involving a very serious uh, trucking accident. And, and the senior VP from the trucking company comes to all the mediations. This is his job. He's all over the country all the time, only handles the worst of the worst cases and they get more than their fair share. And he came in and he and his attorney both kicked things off 
by telling the plaintiff who was also their lay person, they were sorry. Yeah. And they were sorry that the accident happened and no one really wanted to be there. And they wish they could have turned back the hands of time so they weren't all together in the room, but the situation was what it was. And he said, that doesn't mean I'm gonna agree with your lawyer or I'm gonna concede liability and I may argue about the damages and the value, but I want you to know on behalf of my company and, and my lawyer is gonna echo this, we're sorry it happened. I told him afterwards, you can't put a dollar value on that, right? He wasn't giving anything away. He wasn't conceding liability. He wasn't uh, acknowledging the extent of the alleged injuries, but, but he set a tone. And I think that the opening statements can do that. So I always encourage the parties that come before me, don't pass on that opportunity. It's, it's, really, it's really important. I'm, I, and I'll tell a, just a quick war story to, to, to kind of emphasize that. I, I had a, a Hurricane Sandy case uh, a number of years ago now, but boy, when they were coming, they were fast and furious. And I was doing many, many, many Hurricane Sandy cases. Uh, and they always boiled down to a coverage dispute, generally between the homeowner or the business owner and their uh, first party insurer, because the flood coverage came through FEMA, wasn't very valuable to those who even had purchased it. But there was an effort then to try to portray the damages as wind related, which is generally then covered under your homeowner's policy or, or your commercial business policy. Um, so I had a number of attorneys in from the insurance company and it looked something like out of a John Grisham uh, novel. There, there, were, there was a senior partner, there was a junior partner, there was an associate, there was a paralegal all there on behalf of the big insurance company. <clears throat> and in comes this solo practitioner. And I'm going to give away my age, but this guy looked like Peter Falk in Columbo. I mean, he's got the rumpled suit. He's got the whole thing. His tie's a little askew. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what is going to happen here? So this fellow sits down. And, and as my 20-somethings would say in the house, he, he was like a hot mess. I mean, his papers were all over the place. I'm telling you, folks, he starts his opening. And he says, and then, and then I saw this email from one of the adjusters to their manager, and they were mentioning this about the coverage and then he's shuffling around. And then, then I found this other email and I'm thinking, oh my God, before my eyes, this guy is doing a jury opening in a bad faith case. And it was remarkable. And once we finished, and we went into caucus and I had the four lawyers from the insurance company in the room. I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what we're gonna do today? And the senior party looked at me and said, we're gonna settle this case today. I said, you're damn right, we're gonna settle this case today. So again, it just, it, it, they, they didn't see it coming. This fellow's appearance and whole MO was belied what he was there to do. And, and you know what, it worked. So again, I, I, in the concept of kicking things off when we've got everybody in the room, I personally think opening statements are incredibly important. Now, that doesn't mean there are not exceptions to the rule. Listen, we may have particularly sensitive cases, often in the employment context, where you may have had someone who feels that they were wrongfully terminated or were discriminated against or, or listen, uh, someone who in their business family felt they were wrong, that now they're, they're brought into a conference room to face their old boss or to face a vice president. Very, very uncomfortable. Listen, I think you have to recognize there are exceptions. You have to give people deference if they need it. Ultimately, if the opening statement is going to be counterproductive, then you go past it. All right. But I do think it's the exception and not the rule. John? Richard, Richard and the judge, I just want to, I want to move us along because I want to make sure we also hit on some of the other things. But one of the questions is an attorney is obviously coming in as an advocate for their client. What type of particular mindsets do you encounter with attorneys in mediation? <laughs> That's a... 
That is some that a loaded question. Uh, that's a loaded question. Well, you know, the, one of the things that I'll say is sort of an interesting observation is that with the advent of Zoom uh, mediations, I've noticed that overall uh, mediations have become much more civil. Now, that may be uh, for a lot of different reasons, but for some reason, I think that when people are on Zoom and they're looking at each other and it's very difficult to talk over one another, uh, I think that the people have become more courteous. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I find that uh, the majority of lawyers are courteous, but they come into a mediation as advocates and that's problematic. Uh, they don't come in, and again, I'm just going to stress this all o over and over again as negotiators. They are looking to me um, as the mediator, and particularly because I'm a former judge, uh, for ratification of their position. And really, that's not what my role is. It's not what Richard's role is. We don't look at it that way. Our job is to facilitate negotiations, engage in an evaluative process when we can, diplomatically make suggestions, but also, you know, uh, give our opinion and give our assistance to counsel when they request it. So in terms of the personalities, what that ties into and what Richard was talking about in the joint session, you know, there's been this big argument about uh, whether joint sessions are worthwhile, whether they should be waived. I was recently interviewed by law.com. There was an article with four mediators nationally, East Coast versus West Coast. West Coast doesn't like joint sessions, East Coast does. I said, I don't know. I think everybody's all over the map with that. Uh, it, it really is dependent upon what your particular, you know, uh, preference is. But I do agree with Richard because what's happening is, and this goes to Jackie's question, is in the joint session, you're getting a better handle on who you're dealing with. Um, number one, you're saving time because if you know who the person is on the other side and you're getting to a feel for what their negotiation style is in their position, that's critically important. Secondly, who did they bring with them? If you don't have a joint session, and I've had this, and I know Richard has had it happen many times, uh, you'll wind up in the breakout room and the people in the breakout room will say to you, who are those other people in the other room? And I'll say, uh, don't you know? You want me to go find out? Well, if you had a joint session, you would know. And very often that quiet person who's sitting in the other room is the person who is the decision maker. Okay, and now you've opted out of a joint session and you don't even know who you're negotiating with. It's not, and I had this happen recently where the quiet person in the back of the room was the person who controlled all the money and made all the decisions and no one on the other side knew who he was. It's also an opportunity to help educate the mediator, number one, even though you've given submissions, but also an opportunity for a mediator to ask questions and to develop a better understanding of the case. And that's important. But this goes to Jackie's question about the type of people you meet. You meet some arrogant, nasty, obnoxious lawyers in opening sessions. They come in prepared to fight a battle, to fight a war. They're arrogant, they're obstreperous, they're insulting, condescending. And if I were you on the other side, I love it. I embrace it. I take it in because I have two ears and one mouth. And if you want to run your mouth, and talk and talk and talk. I guarantee you one thing about that type of an attorney, that type of personality, they will give you information that is gold that you would have never otherwise gotten. So to answer Jackie's question, Richard and I see that all the time. And I always find it amusing because I'll sit there listening to it and all of a sudden I'll say, wow, I didn't know that about their case. I know that about their case. That really doesn't help them. That actually hurts them. And then the other side is looking like, wow, we just found out something really interesting. But very often what happens is the other side, instead of sitting back and listening, it becomes an ego thing. You know, you're raising your voice. I have to raise my voice. You're being aggressive. I have to be aggressive. Bottom line is my advice, sit back, listen. Okay. Listen twice as much as you speak. Gather all of the information that you can in an opening session, because very often you're going to find out things about the other side's case and about the procedure that they're following and the negotiating strategy that you would never otherwise know. Richard? You know, and, and, and I, I agree with John because I find oftentimes the most effective um, advocates in the context of a mediation are those who come in 
and acknowledge their weak points, right? Where they're not fighting every battle on every issue to the death. I think those who are more sophisticated, who are more prepared, who are more comfortable with their case ultimately come in and don't pound the table. And we do see plenty of that, but come in and say, you know what, for today and today only, I'm not gonna argue this point. I'll concede that point. I'm here to talk about this, right? And to me, it builds their their credibility. And, and I try to encourage that, as, as I'm sure some of you do as well with the parties that appear before you, to, you know what, go for your strengths, right? If you've got a weak point, let it go. Listen, it's not trial, right? We, we're here to try to convince the other side to resolve the matter. You know, give it your best shot. If you fight on every issue, no matter how small, you ultimately undercut your own position, I think. Um, but, you know, to Jackie's question, listen, I, I, I have said more than once, and I know John's heard me say it, I, there's a reality show here somewhere. I, I don't know how we can do it and maintain the confidentiality of the process. Oh, my God, do we see some characters, whether it's the attorneys, whether it's the clients, and it's just, as I'm sure the, those of you, when, when you're mediating, I always say, I, I've got the best job in the world. I, you know what? once, maybe multiple times a day, I, I have a whole new show. I have a new cast of characters. There, there's a whole new plot line. Uh, there, there's laughs, there's tears, there's hugs, uh, all kinds of drama. And it's just remarkable the kinds of people you meet. And as John mentioned earlier, we are chameleons. Listen, do we have certain styles? We do. Do we have certain approaches? We do. But do we kind of play to our audience in order to get a case settled? Of course we do, right? Listen, you know how some attorneys may have to get their ego fed a little bit early on if you're gonna want them to cooperate with you later or sometimes you gotta lay down the law. You know what? You can't have the parties necessarily hijack the process. It's our process. We as the neutrals are here to run the show. We're the neutrals. Ultimately, we've got to keep the horses running around the ring in order to get things resolved. So, but you've, but you've got to play to your audience. I mean, and part of the opening statements, as John alluded to it, he's absolutely right. It's kind of figuring out who they are and what they're about. You know, Sometimes we get to see people on more than one occasion and we know that going in. Sometimes we're meeting them for the first time and we don't know who's playing what part in the play. Who is coming in as the bad cop? Who's going to be the good cop and the decision maker at the end? So again, you're, you're in there kind of feeling this out as you go. But I, I, I do have to tell you, and I'm sure you've had this experience. I mean, you just meet such characters in this business. Richard, oh, I'm sorry, Judge. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, and, and of course, if you want to go back and, and follow up on that, by all means, what do you do when the parties reach an impasse? How do you handle that? Well, that's a good question. And you know what? It's something we, we all face in this business. Um, so, so there's, there's a, a few things I try to do. Listen, I, I think our job, in part, is we are psychologists. Right? We, we have to listen. We have to let parties vent because the one thing you don't want to have happen, particularly if you have non-lawyers in the room, whether corporate representatives or, or lay people, the mediator's not listening to me. That, that's the death knell, right? If somebody in that room thinks you're not listening to them, it's a problem. But as I mentioned before, you can't let them hijack the process either, right? So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act to let these folks vent, all right? Maintain control and not let them, not let them take over the process. So one, when you're starting to hit a rough spot, let them blow off a little bit of steam, take a break. Listen, in the old days, we used to say, go get lunch, all right? We can't say that quite the same way now, but you can, you can take a break. Um, other tools that I 
look to use, you know, if, if we're in negotiation and you want to test certain parameters without having one side or the other unduly committed, I'm, I'm a big fan of what I call conditional offers and conditional demands. Some people call them brackets. I don't call them brackets because people tend to have a visceral reaction to brackets. But I do think they're helpful tools and I call them by a different name on purpose. So I don't draw that reaction. I mean, I have people say, I don't understand brackets. Really? All right, it's not that complicated, but let me put it to you this way. For an offer of X, where do you reasonably want to see them move to? And, and be reasonable. And if they say yes, will you be ready to make the next offer? So that, that keeps us sometimes from having positions hardened or, you know, I'll use a little bit of a loosey or goosier version of it sometimes. And I'll say, listen, is there a universe out there in a heaven somewhere where this case could be negotiated between point A and point B? See if both sides say yes. And if they do, well, then maybe you're gonna get over, over that impasse. Sometimes you just have to adjourn. You know what? It's better to adjourn than hit the wall, you know, which feeds into some of our earlier comments about follow up and, and, and getting things done. Listen, you guys have all been doing this long enough. It's, it's a regular occurrence that we don't get matters resolved on the first go round. That's okay, as long as the case ultimately gets resolved. So if you really think the parties are, are worn out, or you've got a lay person who, who is having trouble, they're tired. Listen, this is, this is really important to a lay person, right? We're, we're business folks, we're, we're lawyers, we're, we're mediators and arbitrators, but this is very intimidating sometimes for lay people when they come in to the process. Maybe they have a personal injury case, maybe they have an employment case, you know, it's, it's, and, and they're overwhelmed by everybody in suits and ties and all the fancy lingo. And you know what? And you can see they're getting tired and you can see they're getting worn out. Listen, you never want to be accused of trying to force a decision on somebody. And it's okay to say to them, would you prefer if we took a break? Rather than letting, letting it hit a wall. Um, John, what, what do you think? You know, I just had so many thoughts on this, but one thing that I will say is I have a mathematical equation or an equation that I always apply to, and I think Richard does the same thing to every mediation. What mediation truly is all about, and this is all about, and it's very simple, is acceptance of compromise. That is what a mediation is all about. You're in a negotiation where people have to accept a compromise. And We've seen it over and over again. People are not gonna accept a compromise in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. They have to come in, they have to readjust mm -hmm. their expectations and they have to readjust how they feel about their case. They have to have the opportunity at the appropriate time. And Richard and I have talked about this many times when we do this and on our own, you have to stage it as the mediator. You're sort of uh, really what you're doing is you're timing to a great extent, how the mediation is going to go. And you're timing it in the sense that we know intuitively when it's time to go back into that room. We know intuitively when it's time to confront a party with a reality in a very diplomatic fashion that they do not want to accept. We know the time when a party is ready to hear that. We know instinctively, have, having done thousands of these cases, exactly the moment to do that. Now, do we get it right all the time? Obviously not. My father tried cases for 40 years and he said, I'm still making mistakes 40 years later, having tried hundreds of cases. You make mistakes every day. But the point that I keep on going back to is, you know, time, you know, is really critical. And what I actually do is if I hit the wall, if there is an impasse, I believe that usually 75% of the times I can break that impasse. And the way I'm gonna break that impasse is I'm gonna isolate the parties in a room and I'll make them sit if necessary for two or three hours until they come to their senses. I hold them hostage, okay? I'm a hostage taker. 
And what I will do is I'll go in and talk to Richard and a few of my other colleagues, Susan Hernandez, Liz Bonina, Ken Grunstein, Bob Adams, and they'll ask me, what are you doing? And I'm saying, I'm waiting them out. That's what I call it. I'm waiting them out. Why do I do this? It sounds horrible. It sounds like I'm an evil human being. No, I'm not. What it is, is I realize they need time to sit and think and accept and reboot and also to allow their egos to calm down. So when I hit an impasse, and I know we all do this, as a mediator, my whole strategy is I'm slowing the process down. And the other thing that I will do very often is I will force the parties, and usually I'll pick two, maybe two attorneys or the key attorneys. I'll get everybody out of the room because you know what happens? I had a case where I have one attorney on one side with five partners, associates, another attorney on the other side with five partners and associates. It got so ugly during the mediation that they were nose to nose screaming about it, screaming at each other. And at that point I said, gentlemen, listen, chill out. I'm going to take both of you and put you in another room, work out your differences, talk to each other. Half of what was going on is that they had to show how tough they were That's right. for all of the other attorneys who were in the room. I put these two gentlemen who I knew very well, and this was actually very unusual behavior for both of them in a room. And within 15 minutes, the case was settled for $25 million mm -hmm. by isolating them by themselves. And what I will do, in addition to slowing the process down, I will pick the key people and put them in a room. Very often, I'll say, you two go into a room and talk for 15 minutes. It takes the pressure and the formality out of the proceeding. And when they're in a room alone with each other, there's nobody to perform for. There's nobody to look good for. They can just talk to each other as human beings face to face and look each other in the eye. And there is something so invaluable about that that our society really in general has rejected now because we exist by email, text. Uh, Zoom is wonderful because we actually get to see each other in this pandemic. But there's nothing in my mind that replaces people talking face to face. It breaks down a lot of walls. And the last thing I'll just touch base, and I know it was on the list, was decision makers. I always suggest to an attorney that is going into a mediation, find out who's coming on the other side and get it in writing that the person who has the power to make the decision is gonna be in the room. Years ago, I did a mediation in Chicago. I fly out to Chicago, it's a two day mediation. The two CEOs and their entire you know, corporate legal department, whatever departments are there, we've got 60 people there. One CEO is from California, the other is from Indiana, we're in Chicago. We get into the mediation room for the joint session and the attorneys start speaking and the CEOs had previously met and the CEO who's sitting on the left side of the table says, hey, wait a second, judge, where's the other CEO? And I look at them and I say like, I don't know, you know, was that a condition of the mediation? The other CEO didn't show up. The CEO who was there got up and said, this is over. We're going to litigate this. So just on that issue of decision makers, knowing who's in the room, Make sure you get that a commitment that the person who's going to make the decision ultimately is in that room. You don't want the people who are negotiating playing telephone tag with the Wizard of Oz who's behind a screen that nobody can see and the mediator can't talk to. Richard? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, 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 I don't know. What's that? I'm sorry, John? I was just turning it over to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, you, you know, I think you're getting the, the, the sense from, from John and I that you've got to figure out who your audience is. If it's important for your parties to make sure the corresponding decision maker is on the other, is from the other side is there, make that a condition to the mediation and, and ultimately play to your audience, figure out what part in the play each one is playing down that side of the table versus this side of the table. And again, that's, that's part of figuring out the strategy of the room and, and ultimately who you as the mediator have to play to. I think the, you know, the next thing that we had on the list, which is really ish, interesting uh, are ethical issues uh, at mediation. You know, and that's a really interesting topic because mediation in essence is an ethical free for all. 
You know, when, when you're in a courtroom with a judge, there's some semblance of control. Uh, a mediator is there to facilitate and evaluate. And believe me, I'm not, I don't want you to think that Richard and I are shrinking violets and that, you know, if someone gets out of hand in the mediation, we're not going to step in. Richard is going to do it. I'm going to do it. We'll take control if people are getting out of control. We'll, we know what we have to do. If that means separating people, terminating a joint session, whatever it is that we have to do, we do. But ethically, it's an unusual process because there is no enforcement mechanism and there is no judge watching this entire process. So what happens is you walk into the room and everything becomes a reliance on everyone else acting ethically and following the rules. And the best guideline for that is the uh, ABA's section of litigation, their rules for uh, ethical conduct and negotiations. And that really relates uh, directly to mediations. There are things that come up over and over again that we see on a daily basis that really, um, I would say, are, are ethical violations in the sense that what is being done is bad faith. And I'll give you a few examples because it ties in with the last uh, subject that we have, which is last minute surprises. Uh, demands and offers. We see this all the time. I had it happen, in fact, today. Uh, the demand pre-mediation was $1.5 million. The demand when we started the mediation was now $3 million. You cannot do that. That is unethical. Um, if a party agrees to mediate a case in reliance on a certain demand that was made, you can't come into the mediation and then change it. Um, it's unethical. But what do you do as a mediator? Well, you have to work around that. What I normally tell people is negotiate as if you're negotiating off of the original demand that was made and ignore the increase. That's a problem. By the same token, if prior to a mediation, you've made up your mind uh, that you've heard a demand and you have absolutely no intention of negotiating with against that demand, that's bad faith. You know, in other words, if someone says to you, well, we see this case is worth over a million dollars and we're never going to take a number that's below a million dollars and the demand is $5 million and you know you're never going to or your client's never going to pay more than $300,000, seriously, why are you coming to the mediation? Say to the other side in advance, listen, we don't view it that way. If that's really the case, maybe the, the case is not ripe to mediate. But to come in then at the time of the mediation and say, well, I'm not going to negotiate against that offer is bad faith. It's not ethical. It's, it's a lack of intent to truly and fairly negotiate. Um, you just negotiate against the original uh, demands or offers, and that's the way to handle it. Settlement terms, this infuriates me. I mean, if, if I was on the bench and someone did this at the end of a settlement process, I, it, would, so, it was like my pet peeve. I'd go absolutely postal. You get to the agreement on a monetary settlement. Someone else comes up with a new term. Mm -hmm. The first time mm -hmm. this happened to me, I, I was... New, really, I'll say I'm new in the business. I learned something every day and I learned something as a result of this mediation. It's a case, horrible construction ag accident. Plaintiff was uh, quadriplegic as a result of the accident. We started the mediation at 10 in the morning. We finished the mediation at 18 minutes of midnight. I finally, with the assistance of, of all the attorneys who were there and working in good faith, was able to get uh, an agreement as to the monetary settlement and all of a sudden, one attorney pipes up and says, oh, well, of the $15 million, we want $5 million of that structured in a structured settlement. And I turned to him and I said, if that's the case, I'm leaving and I'm telling the plaintiff to leave. That's not happening. That's something that you could have told me at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it's not about telling me. It's about being fair to the other side and acting good, in good faith and telling them, if we get to a monetary settlement in this case, there are other terms that are going to be critical. Confidentiality, no admission of liability, payment over a period of time. Um, you know, those types of things, uh, a liquidated damages clause, for example, uh, you know, a settlement that encompasses other claims that you haven't really addressed during the uh, course of the mediation. Another one that I know Richard will tell you drives us crazy, all of a sudden, there is a claim for, an attor for attorney's fees that's never been referenced by one of the parties in the room 
who's ancillary and collateral to the main negotiation. They don't say anything to you until six hours into the mediation when you have a settlement. Oh, by the way, I have a quarter of a million dollars claim and an attorney's fees, and we're not waiving it. Why didn't you tell me that? Forget me. In fairness, ethically, why don't you tell your adversary that at the beginning and say, look, this is going to be a problem. We have to work on this. We have to negotiate it. That's a hardball, bad faith tactic, because what the person figures is, well, they got the monetary and settlement in place. Now I'm going to gum up the works and I'm going to shake them down to get what I want after a very long day. To me, OK, that's completely unethical. And the other thing is, you know, broad uh, confidentiality, non-disparagement agreements. I see them pop up in cases where you don't even expect them. And it's a curveball at the end of the mediation. So the bottom line is, you know, be open about these things. Because in my opinion, there are no specific ethical guidelines for mediations, you know, that are going to really address all these situations. But the whole point is, is that you cannot do these things. And quite frankly, if I was an attorney and someone did this, I wouldn't be hesitate to walk out. I would not hesitate to walk out of a mediation and say, you know what? That's unethical. That's bad faith. I'm out of here. And usually when a party does that, that's when the other person folds. Richard? Well, and you know what? You, you use the phrase, John, and this is how I describe it. Those, oh, by the way. Right. Moments, right? You're, 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 everybody's worn out. You, everyone thinks we've got a deal. So it's, oh, by the way, I need X. And, and it can throw everything into a cocktail. It happened to me today. We, we got the case on, oh, I, I, you know what? I forgot to mention, I need confidentiality. Oh, you forgot to mention. Right. That's a problem. Right. Now, some people will say, well, you know, I didn't want to bring it up earlier. They might think I was weak. They might think I'm here to settle. But then you know what? Use the mediator as the means because we have the power to go into the other room and say, hey, listen, I'm hopeful we're going to settle today. You know, it's a little early on. Are there any terms or conditions you would need at the end of the day if we to get the matter resolved? You know, you see it very often in the employment cases where they want to see non-disparagement. They want to have a, a, a no rehire clause. They want the confidentiality. As John says, get it out on the table earlier because you know what? If you don't, I'm going to start to have my suspicions as well as to whether or not it was just a negotiating ploy and with whether it was really being done in, in good faith. And, and we've all known cases to fall apart at the 11th hour because someone brings in that, oh, by the way, or, oh, you know what, did, did I not tell you we can't pay for 90 days? Oh, you, you, what, you haven't heard about the CPLR? Oh yeah, yeah, but my, my company needs 90 days to pay next quarter, we have to pay next quarter. But the deal's already done. Listen, I, I don't think raising these things makes you look any weaker. It makes you look like a seriously minded attorney who's here to try to resolve it. And listen, let me tell you now, if we get to, to resolution, I hope we do. I need A, B, and C. It's on the table now. We'll talk numbers later. But as John says, it can really be, it can really be a problem. The, the one pet peeve I have on, on this, I might as well vent. Um, when the defendants say to me, this puts John and I in a terrible position. I'll pay this, but I want you to try to save me a little money. Well, that puts us in an awkward and, and terrible position. Listen, we, we owe obligations to both sides, right? Now, now what do we do, right? If we know party B is willing to pay X, but would like to save something off that, well, I, I'm not your champion here. I'm not here to try to save you money. Listen, if you want to say to me, I want to settle this case for X, I'll tell you, look, if you need a little bit more, I could probably get a little bit more. That's a different conversation. But if you're telling me what you, what you have and what you will pay, but you want me to save you a little bit of money, like I said, that, that, it, it, it raises ethical issues for me. And oftentimes, you know what? I don't save them anything because I don't feel I'm being fair to the other side if I do. And I'll go back in and say, well, you know what? I tried, but I couldn't do it. So anyway, that's, that's my little pet peeve, John. So I've just been scanning some of the questions. I'm just going to give some uh, really quick answers. There was a question raised about um, having the clients speak at the joint session. Uh, from my perspective, it is never a good thing to have the client at the joint session unless there's such a good relationship between 
uh, the two opposing sides, which I've had attorneys tell me, oh, they get along, it's a business deal, it's no problem. And then they're jumping over the table trying to kill each other after 15 minutes. I don't like clients at the op opening session. People, you know, argue with me. The mediation that I handled was an employment case. Um, I came in and the mediator demanded that my client be at the opening session. This was a woman who had been harassed uh, at her place of employment. And I said, my client's not coming in. Well, I'm ordering you. I said, you were a judge, you're not a judge. I said, I was a judge, I know better. Client didn't come in. Other side's insisting that the client come in. We're gonna walk out if the client doesn't come in. I said, go ahead, walk out, <clears throat> walk out. Fine, I'll walk out too. They didn't walk out. Finally, the mediator said to me, well, I don't know. How do I know if I believe your client? Now this is on your side, pacing mm -hmm. is what you want the client to know. I said, how do you know? I'm gonna bring my client in now. You ask her whatever you want. I knew that this particular client was the most compelling client. I mean, I hadn't practiced in many years. One of the most compelling witnesses I've ever seen. I knew that I was right when after 15 minutes, the mediator started to cry listening to what she said. All right. Other than that, I keep my clients, I would keep my clients, keep the clients out of a joint session. The, uh, the whole thing is, you know, it's like, keep everybody calm. That's our job. Don't let tensions inflame. Richard will tell you, you know, we'll go into one room. Here's the demand. Here's the offer. And you hear a stream of expletives and yelling and stamping of feet. And they give you the response. And then I go back into the other room. They say to me, what did they, what did they say to you? And I said, well, they appreciate your offer or your demand. They think it's really wonderful and great. Uh, but this is their response. So our job is to keep things calm. The other thing that was I saw come up about decision makers not being there, the, the question was raised while well, in a mandatory mediation, <clears throat> the decision makers are usually available by phone. That's why when I hear the term mandatory mediation, uh, I liken it to military intelligence. It's an oxymoron. Uh, I don't believe in mandatory mediation. Sorry, uh, the court system is big on this. This is why I don't believe in it. I've had, Richard's had the same thing. We have cases that we mediate where the court has ordered the parties to mediate the case. It's a nightmare. The success rate on those cases are not good because the parties don't wanna be there. And mediation is based upon a desire by both parties to be there. If they don't wanna be there, all that's gonna happen is they're gonna go through the motions of mediating the case and inevitably it's not gonna settle. So. Um, I totally get it about mandatory mediations, decision makers not being there. That's why I don't believe in them. Richard? So, you know, I, I'm going to use that as, as a bit of a segue because I know Jackie wanted us to talk a little bit about the time of COVID and, and, and Zoom because, listen, the lack of decision makers is, is always an incredibly frustrating situation for all of us on this Zoom call this evening when, when we're trying to mediate cases. Oh, oh you know what? They're on telephone standby. It's always so remarkable to me how they never answer the phone when they're on telephone standby and you've got eight lawyers in the office and everybody's sitting around like this because somebody in Ohio isn't answering the phone. I have found the Zoom to actually help in that regard because it allows people to participate remotely and be part of the process without having to fly in from some other part of the country, not that many of us are flying these days, but it has allowed more people to participate in a more meaningful fashion than, than before. Not only because it's so easy and it works so well, but it also allows people who might not have had the opportunity, you know, corporate folks, a, a younger uh, lawyer in the law department of, of a big corporation. Well, you know what? They might not have flown him or her in for mediation to sit with the boss, but you know what? They could log in for a few hours from, from their desk. So I'm finding, you know, Zoom to actually help us with the, you know, the, the quote unquote problem that we have faced in the past, you know, the absence of decision makers in the room, because they, they can come into the room and they can come into the room pretty easily and be a meaningful participant. One of the things I just wanted to talk about, and I think it goes back to really the beginning of the discussion when I said, uh, and I think Richard said, use us, use mm -hmm. us during the course of the process. One of the things that I encourage attorneys to do, if they're comfortable with it and the client is comfortable, is 
always meet with the client. And a lot of mediators, I know Richard and I are good with that. We're very comfortable with that. Most of the mediators that I know at NAM are very good with that. I know that a lot of mediators do not like to meet with the client, all right? Um, they'll often say, well, you know, I don't want to pressure them one way or the other. I think that's a cop out. I just don't think they have good people skills. Okay, that's my own opinion. I like to talk to the client because it's the same as when I was a judge. Um, you know, there's a big difference between reading things in a brief, hearing an attorney put forth someone's position and actually hearing the client's side of the story and hearing them out. And what I usually say to the attorneys, even if it's just for me to go in and introduce myself, so they don't, and I mentioned the Wizard of Oz before, and I usually come in that as an icebreaker and say, listen, I wanted to meet you because I don't want you to think I'm the Wizard of Oz, you know, behind the green curtain, pulling all the levers, and you're going, who the hell is this guy, de Blasi? He's a former judge, I've never seen him. He's conducting the mediation and I don't know who he is. So I will always come in and say, listen, I wanted to come in and just introduce myself, just have the opportunity to talk to you. I want you to know my role is not to come in and give you legal advice, to come in and tell you to accept or reject a settlement. Um, if there's a point in time that your attorney wants me to share my opinion with you on the case, I'm very happy to do so. But unless he asks me, uh, I'm not going to do that. And I always want to emphasize to you that if you make a decision today, the most important thing to me is, is that you've had enough time to consider it and that you do not feel in any way pressured to make the decision. And if you need time to think about it, uh, we can always revisit this in a day or so. And a lot of times that's what people need. They need some time to think about it. That's whether it's an individual in a personal injury case or it's a person who's running a major corporation. People are the same. And one of the things that I do say to them, and you can use us for this, is to reduce expectations. I talk to clients about, look, the reason that you're here, you're going to have to change your expectations. You're here for the purposes of acceptance of compromise. And in order to compromise, you're going to have to give up things that you don't want to give up and to essentially accept another view of the case that you came in here not wanting to accept. That's why you're here. Now, whether you ultimately do that or not, that's up to you. But what I also say to them is, I will work as hard as I can to resolve this case today. But I know every plaintiff comes in here or every defendant comes in here with the hope that the case will settle today. They want it over with. And they're disappointed in the event that it doesn't settle. And I want you to know that a percentage of cases do not settle. Uh, but the process itself is always invaluable because we'll learn a lot today. And this goes back to what Richard said. And I said, and I assure you, if the case does not resolve today, I will continue to work on the case after the fact with the attorneys, as long as I can, as long as there's a chance of settling it. Why do I do that? Use me for that because I'm doing you a favor with your client. I'm covering the possibility at the outset of the mediation that it may not be accessible, successful, but that it's still incredibly valuable. The last thing that I do, and again, this could be someone who is in an automobile accident or someone who is a corporate representative. I always say to them, you know, if you're comfortable with it, I would love to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear what you would have to say. And that accomplishes two things. It increases my understanding of the case dramatically. And in many, many cases, it's a release valve for the clients because it's not their attorney who's listening to them. No matter what we say about ourselves, they view us as judges. They view us as neutrals. The opportunity to just tell their story, whether it's a bit business deal gone bad or uh, whatever it happens to be, the opportunity to tell the story informs the mediator, but it also increases the likelihood that the client will accept compromise. Mm -hmm. And I, and I have to agree with that 110%. I think it is very valuable to meet with the plaintiffs, particularly lay people, or it could be a defendant, but oftentimes we see them in, in the role of, of plaintiffs. And I have a, a whole speech that I give them about the process and who I am and how this works and what preparation went into this ahead of time. And But I tell them, before there is any discussion about the issues or certainly about dollars, I, I looked them in the eye. I said, I have to tell you something. You're not going to leave here happy today. 
So let me just manage your expectations from the start. You're not gonna leave here happy today. The other side is not gonna leave here happy today. And if somebody leaves here happy today, I haven't done my job. Because my job in a nutshell is to push both parties to a point where neither one wants to go to. I call it the uncomfortable zone. That my job is to push both sides into the uncomfortable zone where both sides are having a very tough time making the decision, where they're really agonizing about it, where they really don't know what to do. And I say, why is that important? Because that's the point of compromise, as John was alluding to. That's where the cases settle, where there are no winners, where there are no losers, where everybody is convinced there wasn't another dollar to be had, there wasn't another dollar to be saved, but the case can resolve it. And I say to the lay people in particular, look, stay in control. You've got a very fine attorney representing your interests. This is a very, very important decision for you, no doubt, maybe for your family. Why would you put this decision in the hands of strangers? Why would you have six strangers in a jury box make up your decision for you? You know you've got a neutral who's pushing the other side as hard as he can, just like I'm gonna be leaning on you and your attorney when we get into that uncomfortable zone. You won't wake up tomorrow morning thrilled, but you'll wake up with the case behind you and you can turn the page and move on to the next chapter. And you know, and, and as John said, it's, it's about managing expectations, right? From the get-go, that nobody's leaving here thrilled with the result, that we're here to talk about a compromise, that expectations have to be managed, they have to be realistic. Nobody's gonna be clicking their heels and dancing out the door when this is all over with, but the case will be settled. And, and then I tell the lay people in particular, and that's what my job is, that I don't sell happiness here, but I try to sell certainty. I try to sell closure and allow people to put these disputes behind them and then move on in their lives. And what I will add to what Richard said is that we have the best job in the world. We really do. We do. Uh, mm. it, it is so- What's it, more fun than this? It, it, it's just so- in, incredibly gratifying uh, to do what we do. And I think at least I can only speak for NAMS panel. Um, everybody gets that. We love what we do. We take it very, very seriously, as you can tell, even though we joke around. I mean, we do joke around. We have to, because sometimes we see things that are, you know, incredibly tragic. Uh, but we love what we do. And we really care about the process. And we really care about the uh, 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 even though it's hard to care about attorneys, that's tough for me to say because <laughs> I come from a family of nine attorneys. My mother practiced law for 63 years. We do genuinely care about the attorneys. We do. We want every attorney who comes before us to feel they got a fair shake. And we genuinely care about the clients, whether it's a lay person or a corporate person. Yep. We do. And all of us say it all the time. We're so, we, we feel so privileged and lucky be doing what we're doing because it is the greatest gig in the world. It really is. I don't have anything else to say. I'm talked out. <laughs> well, I, before, that's amazing. And thank you. But I want to, I want to just transition because I know we want to leave a couple of minutes at the end for, for questions or additional questions that may come through, but just very, very quickly, March hit, COVID hit. What has the transition been like for you as mediators, for you now going virtual, the majority, if not all of the time. Share with us a little bit of your insight into where we're going with that, what types of cases you may be seeing on the rise as a result of it. And then Ilan, I'll, I'll leave it to you to guide us into what, however much time you think we need for the questions and the That's answers. All right. We're doing great, thank you. Okay, Jen. great, thanks. Well, uh, you know what? It has been a remarkable transition. Uh, I, I think we have, seen a sea change in how we will be mediating in, in the future. Um, the way I've described it to the, to the parties that appear before me, I, I've, I've said, look, once we get to that glorious day when we have a vaccine and we can all go back to some more of a normal life, I, I think the needle's gonna go back in our ADR practices, but it's not going all the way back. You know, this is, it works, as I was mentioning before, it works too well. It's too convenient. It's too economically uh, advantageous and, 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 and it, it does the job. 
And right now it has allowed us to continue to work our cases, resolve our cases. I, I, I don't know, we, we would have been at an absolute loss. Could you imagine what we would, well, we can't imagine what we would have done. It would have been terrible, uh, but we're learning from this. I mean, what's remarkable to me is how quickly everyone has adapted. And as Jackie mentioned, you know, this was part of NAM's MO for, for years. And listen, we would do, uh, video mediations, you know, occasionally it was, it was of interest. You know, I, I, I know we have Ms. Wilson in from the UK. I had one a couple of years ago, big coverage case where I had three underwriters from Lloyd's up on the screen. And, and it was, it was a great, a, a great uh, opportunity to, to deal with them directly without them having to spend the time and the money to come across the pond to be in New York. And you know what? And we got the case settled. So I saw even then how this could work but having it thrown on us and having to flick the switch overnight, I mean, I will tell you, NAM took my entire pending set of cases within 10 days, flipped it on its back, and I was all virtual. And it, it was really remarkable. And everybody was adjusting, right? I mean, the lawyers were adjusting, the parties were adjusting, the neutrals were adjusting, and then all of a sudden, it started to roll and everybody got more and more comfortable with it. Everyone likes it, I think, you know, because listen, what was our biggest issue in the past? Oftentimes scheduling, right? Date, time, and place. Uh, place, not so much now, date and time, right? Place can be, well, where can you log in? Where do you have a good Wi-Fi signal? Um, I think particularly those in the insurance industry, you know, years ago, you'd have an adjuster flown in from Chicago to attend a mediation in New York. I don't think we're going to see that anymore. I don't think these companies are going to invest a, you know, a half a day before the mediation, a half a day for ba the back home, airlines, hotels. Listen, some of the adjusters I'm sure are crying about it because they love to come to New York, but, but it's, it's allowing people to participate in a, in a, in a meaningful fashion remotely. And you know what? Something as simple as a blizzard, right? Okay. Which would have killed our calendars for a day. Well, guess what? Everybody can come in their jammies and their cup of hot cocoa and we can, we can mediate, we can still work. So it's really, it's really been remarkable. I'll, I'll just tell a quick story, not on a big case, but one of the most interesting, I guess, or, or unusual uh, opportunities I had doing this virtually pretty early on it's a straightforward personal injury case involving a fellow who claimed to have damaged his, his left hand. All right, nothing except the guy was a professional guitarist. And I mean, like the real deal. This is how this guy made his living. He played 240 gigs a year. He sessioned for lots of big names. And his complaint was, I can't play the guitar the way I used to. And now I can't play as long. I can't book as many gigs. Well, how interesting. So this was when the, the virus was really peaking here in New York, probably in, in April or so. So I found it so interesting. You know, here I was sitting in my home. I had defense counsel at his home. I had plaintiff's counsel at his home. And the, and the client was down in Florida. So the client zoomed in picked up his guitar and started to play and was showing us literally firsthand what he says, you know what, I'm having trouble with this particular chord. I'm having trouble with this. And you know, it was just so interesting to have a guy from Florida in our mediation, sitting in his home, playing the guitar for us all with serious business to be had as he was explaining how the accident had impacted his ability to play and his ability to make a living. But you know what? That wouldn't have happened before the virus. We, unless this guy was going to drag his guitar up to, up to New York. So it, it's, it's given us some interesting opportunities, some, some interesting insights. I, I will tell you on a personal level, I've met spouses, I've met kids, I've met pets. Um, and it does humanize those who are part of the process. You know, and as John said, Everyone seems to be a little bit more polite, 
Well, maybe because I'm staring at their kids in the living room, right? Or, or I'm watching the, I, I, I'll tell you one quick funny story and then, and then I'll let John take the floor. The, the, the best one I've had so far is I had a, a, a female attorney. She was sitting in her living room with, and you could see the living room to behind her and she's sitting at her computer and she's just dead serious, dead serious, defense lawyer fighting every point. And I'm watching as her five-year-old is behind her on the couch coming up like this. And she has no idea that her kid is doing this. And I, 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 I was trying not to laugh. So I finally said, Miss so-and-so, I, I think you need to turn around. And she looks, oh, Oliver, get off the couch. What are you doing? And you know, it, again, it just humanizes the process. It, 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 it has given us a peek into each other's lives a little bit which is not a bad thing. So, so I have found it to be a very positive uh, um, technological uh, opportunity that, that we have. I'm, I'm glad for all of us that it, it exists. I don't think we're ever gonna go back fully to just in-person mediations. I think we, and, and I've already, I know John has too, we've already started doing what I'm calling hybrids where maybe we have two people in the office and listen, we're all masked up. Nam is very, very careful about all the protocols, but I may have two people on the screen. So it's, that's a new dynamic too, you know, to have some in the room and some on the screen. And we're gonna have to adapt to that as we start to go back to, to what, uh, whatever our, 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 our new normal is gonna look like. There are just so many, you know, stories that come out of this. Um, I mean, it, I, I agree with Richard. I mean, I had a case where I had parties in Germany, you know, Cleveland and Ohio, figure that out, and then parties in New York and Poland. Uh, and it was just so easy, you know, to do it via Zoom and, and, and do it successfully. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I, I will say is, and I just saw this now, it's doing it by Zoom is actually, I mean, our job, we all say it's the best job in the world. It is very stressful. It is only second to trying cases, I would say, because we have a lot of pressure on us, a lot of expectations on us. People are paying a lot of money for our services. So it is stressful. But I guess this is sort of like COVID world. We, we, NAM switched over really quickly and I had done um, a Zoom arbitration where the parties were in New York and Los Angeles years ago. So we had this technology. Um, but when the pandemic started, we went into complete lock lockdown. And I live on 97th Street and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, a few blocks from Mount Sinai. And um, that really was, you know, almost ground zero in New York. We had a field hospital set up in the East Meadow, three blocks from my apartment. Used to walk by there every day. It was horrifying seeing it go up. Uh, it was horrifying seeing the patients taken there. And one of the things we always emphasize to people when we're doing CLEs is, you know, do the right thing, be careful, et cetera, everything that was being suggested by um, the state government. But the interesting thing that came out, about, out of it is I got special dispensation because I live in Manhattan and there was nobody in the office building or NAM Manhattan. I got to go to the office every day if I walked 110 blocks. So my COVID experience has been, um, I've never missed really more than a couple of days in the office. Uh, during the whole process, I walked to the office and I did my Zoom mediations in the office to keep some sense of normalcy in my life rather than being trapped in my apartment every day. And it was therapeutic just going into the office. Although I agree with Richard, I don't think we're going to be going back um, uh, the way we were before because this is just so easy in terms of the travel involved, even if uh, attorneys are local. You know, they could kill a whole day doing one mediation. Um, it's, it's just a game changer in terms of time, efficiency, scheduling, um, cancellations. But I'll go to what Richard said. The interesting part about this is that, so now I've had some hybrids where some parties want to appear, some parties don't. NIM does everything possible to make sure that, you know, uh, we socially distance, we wear masks, everybody wears masks. It's, it's still very difficult. But the interesting thing that I've concluded is that, man, that's hard when you have people in person. I'm walking all over the place. I have to go from one room to another. I'm walking up and down the halls. I mean, I'm too old for this. You know? <laughs> Give me a Zoom mediation at home any day. You know, 
<laughs> don't come into the office. Leave me alone. Just stay home. Uh, and it's actually true. So that's going to be my one observation. I've noticed it the last couple of times. I had a few in-persons and we're like, wow, I never realized how physical my job was. That's right. And that's the interesting part about being a mediator, how physical it is that you are moving all day long. And I was saying, okay, let me just go into NAM New York and do a Zoom mediation. A hell of a lot easier. Everybody, please stay home. Uh, so that's just my, you know, my observation about it. I think Zoom is great. Um, I've been using it like Richard from day one. Uh, I think people, I think I said at the beginning, people are more courteous on Zoom than they are in person. I think a lot of the posturing, you know, and also people have to look each other in the eye, which is important. So in any event, that's my take on it. I don't have any else, else, anything else to say on that topic. Thanks, Judge. Ilana, how do you want to handle questions? I know okay, we're coming so we are we are basically running right at the end of, of our time over here. But look, this is an informal meeting, as I said to, to people before. I'm certainly willing to stay on. We actually do very often at the end of meetings. We stay on you know, for what we call the nightcap session. So uh, I'm certainly going to be around here. Um, you know, I think Chris and Nelson also would be sticking around. But uh, we're going to try to get uh, many of the questions. We did, by the way, knock out a lot of the questions through the course of the, of the uh, program so far. I just want to see if I could pick up one or two of them that we just didn't get to. So one of them was, uh, but again, if anybody has to go at eight, you know, you're not getting CLE credit or what else, you know, certainly go and we hope you enjoyed it. And this program will be recorded to the, uh, to the end whenever we finish tonight. So one of the first uh, questions that we had going back uh, that came out was how would you handle a mediation where one party is relying on a treaty that limits liability to $350 and the other side has actual damages at $250,000. They have a huge gulf here. Mm. You say $250,000? Yeah. Actual mm -hmm. damages at $250,000, but the, the treaty limits liability to $350. Well, my first question would be, why did they mediate the case? I mean, it's <laughs> I, if, as a mediator, my immediate reaction would be like, what are you doing here? Um, it, it's an impossibility to settle that case. I, you know, and, and we see that all the time. People will come in and say, well, I have no intention of ever doing X, Y, and Z, and there's a demand of $10 million. And uh, I think I said it before, you know, I'll often say to the to attorneys, well, you should have called up your adversary in advance and just told them that, you know, and maybe there wouldn't have been a mediation. So my question is, why did they agree to mediate to begin with? Okay, that's, uh, I guess the person who asked the question can, uh, can chime in on that but uh, yeah it's to me it sounds like a it's, it's a good question as well there's certainly we have one person from the nasa county bar association where i'm also a member uh, gene ginsburg who uh doesn't deem uh, adr as alternative dispute resolution he deems it as appropriate dispute resolution and i think that goes to that it's uh it certainly there are some cases which just can be mediated so that could be uh we had a question regarding uh judge de blasio you referenced the colombo character um, I don't know if you want to answer this over the air, but uh, the per person who asked the question wanted to know um, the name of the attorney who uh, gave that uh, the presentation of the... Uh, I'm bound by our confidentiality agreements. I can never mention, and you would never guess either. So that's, you know... Okay, I figured that would be the thing. But by the way, if anybody has any questions for our, for our panelists and what else, uh, one thing I do recommend is that you save the chat. We allow for you to save the chat. You could do that just very quickly for people who haven't done it before by going in the chat box next to the file icon. There are three dots. Click on more and then click save chat and you'll see a little green box that says chat saved. If that uh, is a little complicated, don't worry. I've been saving the chat regularly as we've been going along. So uh, anybody can get uh, you know my chat afterwards, but it, it's also useful uh, if you just want to get some of the resources. And again, if we have questions here that we didn't get to and you asked it, you certainly can uh, just copy that out and uh, contact the panelists um, separately when we're done. Uh, next question that uh, we had was, uh coming you know we actually dealt with most of these uh okay here was a question um one of our attendees asked i would like an opportunity to ask the judge generic question about what's changed in the virtual world the meeting on zoom uh i think we basically uh dealt with that before but i don't know to the extent that uh, judge de Blasio, you want to give your perspective more on exactly what's changed um you know beyond what you've said already maybe take it well I just, uh, just, just a, a, probably the most amusing story I've heard come out of this. I was uh, mediating a case with an attorney who's five feet, two inches tall. All right. And the only reason I bring that up is that he brought it up. 
And we were talking about Zoom mediation and we're talking in a breakout room. And he says, you know, this is the best thing that ever happened to me because everything's, everyone thinks I'm six feet tall now. I use a higher, a taller chair, you know? And he said, he, and, and he actually, there was a little bit of seriousness in it. He said, you know, when I go into mediate a case and I'm five feet, two inches tall and I'm surrounded by people who are much larger than I am, there is an intimidation factor there. He's not intimidated, but there is this psychological factor that goes on. So you know, we we're talking about it. We were saying like Zoom becomes an equalizer mm. because there's no height, you know, and there's no physicality involved. You know, some people may think that's better, but that's the only other thing I would have to say about it. I just like that. I happen to like that story. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and of course you have all the, the uh, Zoom wardrobe stories that go, that go along with that as well. It uh, goes hand in hand. We just had a question that came in. Uh, this one's to me privately. Do you have uh, ever have attorneys who do not want to you to speak directly with their clients in caucus. Sure. Yes. 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 And and, and you know what? We, we can't be presumptuous. We can only offer. And if they say no, I'm not comfortable with that, we have to respect it. And here's the flip of it. I'll we'll get a uh, the attorneys on one side will say to us, well, we want you to speak to the client. And we have that all the time. And I'll say, listen, I can't go in there and demand that they allow me to speak with their no. client. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's not it's not appropriate for me to do that. And it it sort of fascinates me at times that uh, lawyers don't get it. That you know, I can't go in and demand that the client speak to me. That the attorney do that. What I'll say to them is, listen, if the if they want to have the client speak with me, I'm all ears. But I don't have the authority to go in and demand that the other side. Put their client in front, front in front of me and allow them to allow me to speak with them. So that's the flip side of it. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, I think we have gotten through every question. We had one outlier. Okay, we there. We have one outlier left, and then uh, we're done. We're going to clear the uh, the chat after this one. Uh, I think it goes back to uh, communication with uh, uh, difficult uh, attorneys. If you know a, a stone cold killer attorney, as uh, you were saying, Judge Blasby, before, if an attorney has a problem with uh, the behavior of another attorney, uh, the other attorney on the other side, would it be useful to tell you about that in advance? Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think that's one of the the benefits of, of speaking to the parties before the session, you know, whether there is bad blood between them, whether they've had issues, whether there has been some belief that they were not being treated fairly or one side wasn't being forthright or misrepresenting things, better we know ahead of time than have something go awry in, in the session. So yes, it's very important for us to know. We often hear a counsel will tell us in advance, they'll call us and say, listen, I hate opposing counsel. Opposing counsel hates me. The clients hate each other. We don't want a joint session. Put us in separate room and negotiate the case. And you know what? That's sort of a rarity, but it, it does happen. And it goes again in advance. I think then that's it. Thank you everyone so much and particularly our speakers uh jackie uh judge de blasi and richard thank you so much for a very informative presentation i can just tell you i've gotten uh, numerous uh, compliments in the chat i think this was uh, a really informative as well as entertaining uh presentation you know they, 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 these so many different issues that have come up and you touched on so many different topics so this is going to be uh not just uh something which is uh, again entertaining but also extremely practical and educational so thank you so much for uh, participating with us tonight. And um, again, if anybody has any questions for our, our panelists, uh, certainly you could direct them to me or you know, we have their uh, email addresses, we can give them to you. And our, our, our European, uh, actually Barbara Wilson, just so you guys know, Barbara Wilson, she stayed the entire time. So congratulations, you, you called that one, Judge Blasi. She, she's gone to bed uh, one o'clock in the morning, whatever the case is, but thank you, uh, you know, Barbara for staying. And I also Chuck Canopy was in Berlin. He also basically stayed uh, the entire time through. So thank you so much for our, our international participants. Um, it is late, you know, for everybody's like that. So I'm, I'm gonna sign off in a second, but again, uh, just very quickly, uh, please, uh, for those who are people who are ADR committee members, uh, please get in your dues, as I said before at the beginning of the uh, presentation, and also um, do take note of the many uh, events that are going to be coming up. Again, just very quickly, the next thing that's officially on our docket, uh, or our schedule for uh, the ADR committee's mediators meeting online, that's going to be Tuesday, November 24th. 
um, from uh, 7 p.m., uh, sorry, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we go for one hour, but sometimes, again, just like this, we go a little bit longer. And we deal with topics from uh, any type of aspect of mediation, whether they're technical topics about what's going on in Zoom, or alternatively, many of the topics that we talked about over here, what are you doing in certain situations. And of course, we'll be probably talking a little bit more within the bounds of confidentiality of the evolution of the, uh, the Part 137 program that we've been working on. So um, if anybody has any questions, now's your, your last chance. Other than that, uh, again, I just want to reiterate my thanks uh, to Jackie and also to, uh, to Sh Sharon, uh, as well as Nina and, and everybody else who uh, worked behind <laughs> the scenes for doing this, Tony Valenti from NYCLA and Azalea Cuts. They all put together a, uh, a great uh, set of materials and uh, your efforts, you know, even if you're not necessarily appearing on the panel, what else, it's, it's always important to acknowledge that your efforts are greatly appreciated. So thank you very, very much. Pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So again, this is being recorded as soon as we're done, which is going to be basically right now. I'll send the link out um, to everybody who wants it. And um, I, I wish everybody great luck uh, and success with their cases. And continue to be safe and have a great night. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye -bye.